Right, okay. This video is for B2, investigating organisms in an environment. Okay, right now, before I go any further, I want to introduce a real life example of this being done that we did, that I did as a teacher with six one kids. That way, when I relate back to things, at least they'll be able to understand why we're doing stuff. Alright, so if I can give you an example, alright, of why we have to investigate our organisms in the environment. I'm going to talk about this one. We would take a set of sixth form kids, okay, to the seaside, all right? Because on the seaside, there lives a little organism called a dog whelk. Now, I don't want you to panic about what's going on, but the simple fact is, the dog whelk, we hypothesised, changed according to where it lived. Now, let's try to give you an example. We went to two beaches, alright, I'll put a nice little sandy beach there, and there is the, the shore, alright, so there's the sea, and there's the shore. And there were two different seas and shores, and one of them was very, very exposed, or windy, and the other one was sheltered, alright, so I'll call that an exposed shore and a sheltered shore. Do you get what I mean by exposed and sheltered? We just kind of say that one was getting battered by the waves and the wind, and the other wasn't. Alright? And we went to go look at the dog whelks that lived on these two rocky shores. It just means they were stuck. This isn't a beach, by the way. It's almost like a, a rock face where the waves would hit. Alright? And we went to look at these two shores to see if the dog whelks were different. Alright? Now, we hypothesised that the size of this opening and the shells was different based on where they lived. But that's not the point. What I want to come back to is and talking about what you need to know is that first of all like any living organism these dog whelks had to compete for resources and you need to know what resources organisms compete for all right so the first little bit we need to know is competition and what resources are living organisms compete for okay and I'll start us off. Light. Now the dog whelks aren't necessarily competing for light, but a lot of living organisms do. Can you tell what kind of living organisms are going to compete for light? Plants. Good. And this is a classic exam question. And you must link that to photosynthesis. Why do plants compete for light? Because they need to photosynthesize. Alright? And very often the classic exam question is. One planet is in shade, one planet is in sunlight, why does one grow more than the other? Okay? And that's about the light getting more, sorry, a plant will get more light, therefore do more photosynthesis, so it will produce more glucose, therefore it will grow more. Alright? But that's just one of many. Because plants and other living organisms may also compete for water. They may compete for minerals. Ions, such as nitrates, and again, that's a plant thing. They compete for space. Plants, animals, living organisms compete for space. I'm going to put this on here. Food. Alright, and... So far... Up until here, we're talking about non-living factors. And they give those a posh name, it's called abiotic. Alright? But then we also have to talk about living factors, such as food and predators. So we compete to not get eaten. And we compete to eat. Alright? So those are the main factors that living organisms compete for. Are we all with me there so far? Okay. So... What we do when we investigate an environment is to see how organisms are competing, which organisms compete better, and maybe try to work out why. Alright? But we took our kids to this rocky shore and we asked them to see if the dog whelks were bigger or smaller on one of these shores. Okay? Now that is called sampling. Now the problem is, 
There are about, on these rocky shores, 10 million dog whelks. I might be exaggerating, but do you get the point? And if I asked them to go measure, even though there was a whole 30 class of six followers, every dog whelk on this shore and this shore will be there till next year. And we've only got a week. So we have to take a sample of the area. I can't count every dog whelk on either shore. I have to say, okay, we'll take a sample to give us an indication. Would you agree with that? And there are two main ways in which we sample an area. And we sample because we haven't got time to do the whole thing. But what we want is a representation. Do you get me? So we sample because we need a representation of an area in a suitable time. And the two sampling methods you need to know of, and we put these two together, and often when you're investigating about it, you do put them both together, but I need to know about two things, a transect and a quadrat. Now again, I'll come back to my real life example to try and give you a better description of what was going on. We could have asked our children, and again, I'm going to try draw the rocky shore here. This is the rock, and this is the sea. And I hope you can see that on there will live all these dog whelks. Is that fair enough? Okay, now. I obviously, as I've said before, we can't count all the dog welts, and actually we can't measure the size of the dog welts on the whole shore. So what we could do is take a tape measure, and believe it or not, this is a very scientific piece of equipment. We take a tape measure and create a line along the shore with our tape measure. All right? And we say to our students or our scientists, I would like you to only sample, and I'll have to put one on here otherwise I'm in trouble. The dog whelks that appear along your line or your transect. So as soon as we place that tape measure, and it's normally at 90 degrees to wherever it's the shore, if we place that along there and we only sample the organisms that hit or touch the transect, we're sampling. We're not looking at the whole thing, but we're looking at a decided or a given area. Would you see what that is? Do you see how that works as a transact and how that is used to sample? There's another way of doing it. We can take the same rocky shark, I wish I'd chosen somewhere better now, with its dog belts on it, and we can take a piece of equipment called a quadrat. Normally a metre squared separated up into quadrants and I can place that quadrat onto random, very important word, onto random places on the shore and count the size of the dog whelks inside the quadrat and inside the quadrat only. Okay? Now, the key word I use there is random and for your exam you have to write that that you would place quadrats randomly in the area all right now there's, there's ways of doing that there's a thing called a random number table which means you separate these into quadrat into quadrants and you place it according to the random number table or you could just throw it over your head all right the reason you're doing it randomly is to prevent bias Right, to prevent you going, oh, I like the look of that little bit there. There's loads of dog whelks there. I'll put it on there. That's you influencing where you're sampling. All right? Random means it must be chance. All right? So, one, two, three, four. Now, I want to give you a little bit more couple of pointers, which comes back to this. So, if you just bear with it. There's a typical exam question. That I need you to know about. Okay? Often 
you are given a picture of said quadrat and it has inside it a plant. That bit there in the quadrat is a plant. And it will ask you to tell me to estimate the proportion or the percentage of the plant in the quadrat, are they? Alright? And there's a rule I need to tell you about. You count the squares that are either full of the plant or more than half full, a la that one. This square, because it's not more than half full, you say it doesn't contain any plant material. And by doing that, you gain an idea, mm, yes, mm, no, mm, no, and by doing this you can estimate a percentage of how many squares are covered by that plant. By taking the amount of squares that are covered by the total and times in that either by a hundred to give you a percentage or even a ratio. If I look at that, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven of my quadrat squares are covered with a plant, whilst there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 in total. Alright? And by doing the maths, I will be given a percentage cover. Let's think 8, 16, 50, so I'm going to call it 45% cover. And that's about as hard as the maths are going to get for you. The only other thing you need to know is one more point, and that is. For this data to be reliable, for your data to be as reliable as possible, and you will get asked this question in the exam, is your data reliable? How could you make your data more reliable? The classic one is to, not quite repeat, because that's getting a bit lazy now, but to have a large sample size. You want that perfect relationship between taking it as little time as you can, but getting as big a amount of samples as you can, alright? If I went to that rocky shore and placed three quadrats down and walked off, is that reliable data? No. If I go to the rocky shore and take a day placing ten quadrats each between 30 students, that's 300 samples, that's more reliable data. Okay? And finally, you will sometimes get a question, is your data valid or is the data on the exam paper valid now that's very difficult for data to be truly valid you have to control all other variables now i'm going to give you an example of what i mean by that on the rocky shores that we were looking at with our six farmers we were saying that the dog whelks on the more exposed shore would be smaller because they were getting battered by the wind and the waves. Only by controlling everything other than exposure can I guarantee that that is why the dog whelks are a different size. So my experiment wasn't very valid because I couldn't control every other factor other than exposure. So that's what I mean by valid where all the other variables except for the one that you're investigating are kept the same.